This is Viewpoint. Welcome to Viewpoint. I'm Doug Petcash. In five weeks, on Tuesday, November 8th, voters across Idaho will head to the polls in the general election to decide on who they want to represent them in key federal and state offices. Last Sunday and today, we're focusing on one of the big races here, the race for lieutenant governor between longtime Speaker of the House, Republican Representative Scott Bedke of Oakley, and Democrat Terry Pickens Manweiler of Boise. Speaker Bedke was my guest last week. Bedke has served in the Idaho House of Representatives since 2000 and as speaker since 2012. He is the longest serving speaker in Idaho history. On Viewpoint last week, he talked about why he's running for lieutenant governor, his view on the role of the lieutenant governor, as well as his priorities and his stances on key issues in Idaho, including the state's strict new anti-abortion law and public education funding. You can watch that interview on KTVB.com. Today, Terry Pickens Manweiler is my guest. She is a fourth generation Idahoan who was born and raised in Pocatello. After law school, she served as a public defender for Nez Perce County in Lewiston. She moved to Boise in 1999 to start her career as a trial attorney. Pickens Manweiler is the founding partner of Pickens Law PA, which she started in 2008. She's also a wife and mother of two children. Today is her opportunity to lay out her vision, priorities, and stances on the issues. So I, right now I'd like to welcome in Terry Pickens Manweiler. Thank you for being here today. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the time. Well, let's talk the umbrella question first of all. Why are you running for lieutenant governor? Well, as many Idahoans have seen the last couple of years in this state, we've seen a real shift in Idaho. And I'm fourth generation Idaho and I was born and raised here. I'm raising my children here. And the Idaho that I see today is different than the Idaho that I was born and raised in. And I see a real shift in the politics in this state. And I decided that, you know, somebody needed to stand up and, and say, let's get back to having real conversations about real Idaho issues, not issues that have been the last couple of years. Shift in what way? I would say a shift to the far right. The extremism in this state has become national headline news. And, you know, that wasn't the Idaho that I was born and raised in. And it's not the Idaho that I want my children to be born and raised in. I want my children to be in the Idaho that I'm familiar with, where we can all sit at the same table and uh, have a, you know, political discourse rather than what I see today is just extremists, you know, on each side not coming to the table. So how do you view the role of the lieutenant governor? Well, if you would have asked me that question six years ago, I would have had a different view on what the lieutenant governor was, and I would have just thought, well, it's just the person who's going to succeed the governor if something should happen. But that's not how I see the lieutenant governor's office anymore. The present lieutenant governor has really put a profile on this office, and not in a good way. The office of lieutenant governor really should be a second wing of the executive branch to support the governor. And we're in a situation in Idaho where we have a present lieutenant governor who can't even sit in the same room with the governor, let alone operate the executive branch, sit down, have conversations about policy, and do the business of the Idaho people. The uh, office of lieutenant governor should be that supporting role, and the office of lieutenant governor should be a supporting role for all Idahoans to be able to get the business of the people done. Well, let me, let me ask you more about that, because as a Democrat, here in Idaho, of course, it's not the governor and lieutenant governor don't run as a ticket, obviously. Right. Um, so if you win and if Governor Little is reelected, how would you work with him? I think I'll be a breath of fresh air for Governor Little, actually, compared to what he has right now. The idea that you have to be of the same party, it, it just isn't the case in Idaho. We've long had lieutenant governors who are of different parties. Let's go back to Cecil Anderson in the 90s when he had his lieutenant governor that, uh, then went on to be Governor Butch Otter. And the two of them worked as statesmen. They worked together as gentlemen. They sat at the table together. They discussed policy together. And I don't see that being any different for myself and Governor Little. You know, he really does appreciate having other viewpoints. And that is really critical when you're talking about big issues that impact Idahoans. To have another voice in the room that's different than the one that you constantly hear is going to be helpful. Diversity in thought is critical, and we need that in Idaho. And I think he'll appreciate having that voice at the table. So you mean like bringing in that Democratic perspective into the, a Republican um, executive branch? I mean that, but I also mean when I say diversity of thought, you know, I think that 
I want to talk about Idaho values when I'm talking with the governor, not necessarily Democratic values or Republican values, because the people of Idaho that I've met with and talked with, we all have the same values. We all want public education. We all enjoy our public lands. We all care about civil rights and freedoms. You know, those aren't one party or the other, but how we perceive them to achieve those goals, that's where I think diversity of thought is important. This question takes a little bit of a setup, but um, we saw on at least one occasion when Governor Little was out of state, um, as acting governor, Janice McGeehan issued an executive order that the governor didn't agree with and then rescinded it upon returning. Um, and she had said and argued that the state constitution says if the governor becomes ineligible to serve, including due to absence from the state or inability to discharge the powers and duties of his office, the lieutenant governor steps in. That is what the constitution says. So my question for you is, when the governor leaves the state, who do you believe holds the power of the governorship? Well, as I read the statute, Doug, it is who the governor says. You know, if the governor leaves me those powers, then I will certainly exercise those powers. Uh, the, the way that the statute reads is a little bit vague, I will agree. But one thing that I can assure the people of Idaho is that I'm not going to play the same games and do the same antics. You know, the governor is still just a phone call away anywhere. We have technology these days that, you know, weren't around when that statute was written. You know, thing or the Constitution was, was written. The idea that I could just pick up a phone and say, hey, Governor, I've got this issue while you're out of state. What should I do? That's a conversation between two adults in the executive branch that just isn't happening right now. I think that the governor will trust me with those duties and obligations, and I don't believe that uh, we're going to see the same uh, discourse around this topic once I'm the lieutenant governor. The lieutenant governor presides over the Senate also right. as well. So what do you think is the key to being effective in that role? So I'm a certified mediator. I've been mediating cases for years and also a 25-year trial lawyer. And so I understand conflict, I understand adversity, and I understand there's always two sides to an argument. As the president of the Senate, what I would be in charge of is holding the gavel and, and maintaining the proceedings in the parliamentary process. I appreciate that process. One thing that I think is important and critical to the process is hearing everyone's voices, you know, to hear all sides. And I think for too long in Idaho, we've had a 30-year supermajority. Uh, we haven't heard both sides, at least not equal time, at least not to the extent where the Idaho people feel like they're being represented. As the president of the Senate, I can assure that those issues are going to be fully argued, fully talked about, and uh, you know, fully disclosed on where those bills came from, what they're all about, before our legislators vote on them. And, and these days, it's not just two sides. That's it's, a good point. You know, three or four. Yeah, or and more. some of it's not real and I appreciate that. One of the things I want to do with the lieutenant governor's office is create an office of disinformation. The research is where these bills come from. Research, are they, are they true? Do they, are they based in fact? Are they based in science? Where did they come from? Why are they being brought in Idaho? Because I think once the people of Idaho understand and appreciate where some of these bills are coming from, um, they're not going to support them. Can you do that statutorily? Is in the, the role of lieutenant governor? Absolutely. I have full-time employees that I can staff to do whatever my office sees fit. And I can use a full-time employee just to do research on these bills and uh, use the office for good. I'll, let's go back to the, the present lieutenant governor's critical race theory task force. She used the office for bad. I plan to use the office for good. To stay kind of on that topic, we've seen lieutenant governors in the past have, you know, special projects that they focus on or issues that they focus yeah. on. Do you see yourself having one specific thing, or are you going to be more broad-based? I would say there are two things that I really want to focus on in my tenure as lieutenant governor. The first and foremost is restoring women's reproductive freedom in this state. I will do whatever I have to do to ensure that my daughter has the same freedoms and liberties that I've had my whole life. The second thing is I really want to make sure that this level of disinformation that we're seeing make it all the way to the state house uh, gets quelled. And I want to talk more about that in the next segment as well as we get into more of the issues. But, um, you know, outside of politics and this campaign, what are you passionate about? I'm passionate about my family, first and foremost. I, I am a trial attorney by trade. I love what I do. I love the thrill of going into a courtroom and, and winning a trial. But at the end of the day, I go home to my 12-year-old son and my 18-year-old daughter and my wonderful husband. And the idea that they might have a different future in Idaho than what I've had really troubles me. And so I'm very passionate about making sure that, you know, my 18-year-old daughter, who is also gay, has a place in Idaho. 
feels warm, feels welcome, feels safe here. And you know, as of late, with the the and I'm going to use the word edict from the Idaho Republican Party and Dorothy Moon to literally criticize my daughter's community, she doesn't feel safe here. And mm -hmm. you know, I feel passionate about making an Idaho that is safe and welcoming for her to come home to from college. And so that's a real big one for me. And public lands, and you know, this is Idaho. I, you like to get outdoors, right? I really do. I have lived at all three corners of the state. I was born and raised in Pocatello, and I spent you know 18 years there. I spent almost six years in North Idaho with law school and as the public defender in Nez Perce County, and I've been in the Treasure Valley since 99. And in that time, I've gotten to see the entirety of this state. It's beautiful. You know, through and through, we've got so much beautiful federal land, we've got so much beautiful state public land, and that really needs to stay there and be preserved and protected for not just my generation, but generations to come. On that note, let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk with Terry Pickens Manweiler about her top priorities as she wins the race for lieutenant governor and her stances a little more in depth on some of the big issues here in the Gem State. Stay tuned. And welcome back to Viewpoint. Today we're focusing on the race for Idaho Lieutenant Governor between Republican Speaker of the House Scott Bedke and Democrat Terry Pickens Manweiler. Speaker Bedke was my guest last week. You can watch that interview on KTVB.com. I'd like to welcome back in Terry Pickens Manweiler now to focus on her priorities and stances on some of the big issues. Um, first of all, I, I read in the Lewiston Tribune that, that you were a Republican until 2018 and then switched party affiliation. Why did you switch? Well, honestly, I was a registered Republican. I was a lifelong Republican, actually. Um, I switched after the 2018 election because I felt like the Republican Party left me. As I mentioned, um, I'm a mother of a gay daughter, and I saw a real shift in the party, um, one for women's reproductive health care and for uh, my daughter's right to marry who she wants to marry. And I don't see that changing in Idaho. I see it getting worse. And I couldn't, in good conscience, after that. And, you know, frankly, after the big lie in 2020. That was that was the end of it for me. Was we had a duly elected president, and the Republican Party wouldn't publicly say that, and that was a real trouble for me. So, are you a Democrat on the social issues, but still a Republican maybe on fiscal issues? How would you talk would, about you know yeah. the blend of that? I would count myself as a fiscally conservative person, in terms of you know, financial policy, economic policy. But when it comes to social issues, I believe that we are all right and entitled to our freedoms. And, you know, I would consider that a conservative value, but it's just not the present Republican Party value. You know, I believe in freedoms for everyone, not just for a certain group. So let's talk more about, you know, the big issue here. Yes. Uh, one of them has been the, the strict anti-abortion law, which um, a judge has put a pause on the law when it, come, when it conflicts with the Federal Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act so that doctors won't face criminal charges in these instances because state law has to yield to federal law. But, and the judge also said the law lacks clarity for providers to be able to perform an emergency abortion. Just, first of all, just about the, the new law itself. Okay. How do you, what do you think about it? Well, it's draconian and it's cruel. And with our legislature passing this law, the cruelty is the point. And let me explain why. I did have an opportunity to watch my opponent on this program when you asked him about my comment about how he and another Republican, Scott Herndon, would like to see women in jail. I take issue with the gaslighting response that you received from him. He called it absurd. What he didn't tell you, Doug, was Idaho Code 18-606 is still on the books today. It's not being st stalled by any court. Um, there are three lawsuits pending right now, the Planned Parenthood lawsuits, two of them against two statutes, 18606 being one of them. That lawsuit, or that law specifically says that if a woman seeks an abortion and receives an abortion, she is guilty of a felony and up to no less than one year of jail time. That's on the books today. That is not something I made up in a tweet. That's the law of the land. And my opponent is vehemently opposing those laws, both at the Idaho Supreme Court and the uh, now um, trying to appeal to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Those laws um, do not account for the health of the mother, do not account for women who are in medical crisis, do not account for um, a large number of pregnancies that end in miscarriage. 
Miscarriages um, have specific treatments. And under our current draconian law, they would not be able to seek that treatment in the state of Idaho. That's cruel. The speaker did say that he believes in exceptions for the health of the mother and rape or incest. Um, and that believes that the law may need to be, at least if it stands the way it is, that it at least needs to be clarified on the, the gray areas of the medical issue. If it stands the way it is, what do you think should be done with or about the law? So there are two statutes that we're talking about. We're talking about the abortion statute and we're talking about the fetal heartbeat statute. They're two separate and distinct statutes. Both of them need to be repealed in their entirety absolutely repealed. Neither one of them offer any guidance to doctors how they should treat their patients, and none of them provide fundamental freedoms of choice for women in this state. We know with the Idaho legislature, because they've said so out loud, that they're not just coming for abortion care in Idaho. They're coming for our reproductive health care, our contraception, our plan B. They're coming to basically tell women in Idaho, you don't control your reproductive health. And how, as Lieutenant Governor, would you push for that? What would you do? Well, I'm actually going to prepare draft legislation that I'm gonna try and get pushed through the House and the Senate. Because I think we've hit a point in Idaho where Idahoans have said enough is enough. You've seen enough voter registration just since June 24th when Dobbs was handed down in Idaho for people to tell these legislators that this is not the law that they want to be in Idaho. They want that repealed. They deserve it to be repealed. Women in Idaho deserve to have access to reproductive health care. I mean, I will, you know, go an extension further and say the issues we're having with the national news that the University of Idaho has sent a memo saying, we don't know if we can talk about reproductive health care in, in uh, our student health centers, in our classrooms. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where we've come because of this poorly written, ridiculously drafted law that is currently the law of Idaho. You know, there's a reason the Department of Justice and you know, are is suing Idaho because doctors just can't tell what they're supposed to do. And that's not healthy for Idaho and not healthy for our community. Um, I do want to get to some other of your top priorities yeah. and stances on things. And I want to start with um, public education. First of all, we saw the state legislature and the governor during the special session approve $410 million um, in extra funding for our public schools, but they didn't earmark that or direct that in any way. Right. Where do you think that money should go? Great question. And first, I want to congratulate Reclaim Idaho for forcing the hand of the Idaho State Legislature on a job that they should have been doing for years. But they've underfunded our education system so dramatically that there's so much we need to do, it's almost impossible to know where to start. I think where we really start, we start with teacher salaries. You know, we, we deserve to have educators in our state that are making the same as our, our neighboring state. So they aren't leaving to go to Oregon, Wyoming, Utah, where they can make a bunch more money. They need to be paid and compensated accordingly. They also need to have programs in place to support them. You know, we saw through COVID, through the pandemic, that our teachers and our administrators really suffered. They suffered because of a bunch of misinformation and disinformation that we see. But we also saw them, ha you know, have situations where their kids were having mental health crisis. You know, they're having learning issues because of the pandemic. And those teachers also need support. You know, we need to have mental health counselors in schools. We need to have school nurses in schools, every school, not just the big urban ones, rural schools. And then I think then you talk about infrastructure in these schools. We need to make sure that all of our schools are funded equitably. You know, I know I'm not going to use the word equally because I know that some smaller schools don't need as much money as bigger schools, but they should be funded equitably, meaning that a, a school in Burley, Idaho, should have the same access to broadband and internet that a school in Boise has. That a school in Middleton shouldn't have kids being taught in the, in the hallways because they can't afford a new classroom. Equitable. We need to make sure that that funding gets, you know, across to all of the schools in Idaho and that our infrastructure is restored. Other issue, of course, on, um, on your list is public lands. Yes. Um, what do you think should be done about or with public lands? How do you feel about those? So this is where you can see a distinct difference between myself and my opponent on the issue of public lands. Um, he got through the Federalist, Federalist Commission in Idaho to appraise the federal public lands in Idaho. And you know maybe not for, in his mind, a nefarious purpose, 
but to bring those federal lands under public domain in Idaho, to be governed by Idaho. And I don't see that as a solution to our public lands problem. What I see is vastly different. You know, the first major forest fire that we have in Idaho, and if it's all Idaho lands, we don't have federal resources to fight those fires. What are they going to do? They're going to sell off and privatize the public lands. One of, this is one of the biggest issues I've talked to with voters across the state. They are genuinely concerned that their hunting units will be sold off and privatized, that their access to BLM land will be closed off because somebody has come in and bought the, the property and put up a gate. They're genuinely concerned about that, and my, my opponent is, is darn happy to you know, privatize the federal lands in Idaho and bring them under Idaho domain. I don't see that as a solution. I see the solution that we certainly need to do some restructuring with how the government compensates Idaho for the federal lands in this state. We're 61 to 62 percent public lands in this state, and that's quite a bit of this state. But that's what makes Idaho so great, is we have access no matter where we live in this state, whatever direction you want to drive, to somewhere pristine, somewhere beautiful, somewhere where you can teach your kids how to shoot their first buck, somewhere where you can go, you know, throw your fly rod in the river, um, and somewhere where you can ski down the most beautiful mountain slope, you know, arguably in the country. And those need to stay public for the public use. And that's just a difference that me and my opponent share. And um, finally, in a little bit of time we have left, um, civil rights. What's your focus on civil rights? Well, there are many, actually. But right now, it's, it's reproductive freedom. You know, the United States Supreme Court literally stripped away a fundamental freedom and right that was granted to women in 1973. I am 50 years old. I, my entire lifetime, had the protection of reproductive freedom, the right to be private in my decisions that I make with my medical providers and my spouse. And women don't have that in Idaho anymore. That is no longer the case. A government mandate has told them what they're going to do in their bedroom and what they're going to do in their doctor's office, and that is not a fundamental freedom. Um, I do also really believe that the LGBTQA community is unrepresented in Idaho. Why has it been so many years and we haven't added the words for the discrimination statutes? Why? You know, I still come back to it. So they just don't care. And somebody needs to speak up for this marginalized community because I do care. I care and I know a very large chunk of Idaho cares. And we really need to be focusing on making everyone feel welcome in this state, not just a handful. Terry Pickens, Manweiler, thank you so much for your time, your thoughts and positions on the stances and um, you know, getting to know where you stand on these things. So thank you for being here today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Appreciate you. And I'll be right back to wrap things up. If you missed part of my interview with Democratic candidate for Lieutenant Governor Terry Pickens Manweiler, you'll be able to find it on KTVB.com. My interview with her opponent, uh, opponent, Republican Speaker of the House Scott Bedke, is on our website as well. Also there, you can find my past interviews with Republican U.S. Senator Mike Crapo and his Democratic opponent, David Roth. And that is all of our time for this week's Viewpoint. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Doug Petcash. I'll see you later today for the Sunday News at 4.30, our special early NFL edition, as well as the Sunday News at 10. And of course, right back here next Sunday morning for another Viewpoint. Have a great day.